members is the appointed time and we have already formed the quorum. I now call the meeting to order. Item 1. Confirmation of minutes. So it's the meeting held on the 17th of March and the minutes have been circulated to members and the Secretariat has not received any proposals for amendments. If there are no proposals for amendments here and now, shall we confirm the minutes here? Uh, can we have a proposal? Thank you, Dr. Lau. All right, Mr. Chair uh, has seconded. So minutes confirmed. Item 2 on the agenda, information paper issued since the last meeting. Since the last meeting, the Secretariat issued the following information paper, and that's the submission on meal break arrangements for ambulancemen grade in the Fire Services Department from the Hong Kong Fire Services Department Ambulancemen Union. We have also written to the Civil Service Bureau asking them for a reply, but we have yet uh, to receive that reply. So my question for members is, would you like to discuss that at our future meetings? It's about uh, meal break arrangements for ambulancemen. Yes, sir, Mr. Kwok. Yes, of course, uh, I think there is a need, Madam Chair, because the administration has yet to come up with a specific reply. We will have to look at the reply before we decide whether or not we need to take it up further. All right, so we'll put it um, on the list of outstanding items for our future meetings. Item 3, date of next meeting, and items for discussion. Shall we invite the Bureau Director to join us before we discuss that? Good morning, Bureau Director. Good morning, Permanent Secretary. Or, or Under Secretary. Good morning, everyone. Item 3 date of next meeting and items for discussion. Early on this year. The administration already proposed that uh, the, well, the next meeting will be uh, held on the 23rd of June at 4.30, and the administration has proposed to report to us the following items. One, 2014-15 civil service pay adjustment. Two, employment of persons with disabilities in the civil service. So do members agree? that these two items be discussed at the next meeting. All right, our members are in favour. So my question for the Bureau Director is this. With regard to civil service pay adjustment, in fact, uh, you'll be reporting to us in June. Would that be a little too late? Is it, or is it on schedule? Well, Madam Chair, we have followed the schedule, and our target is to go to FC in around um, July. So we hope to consult the panel in June, and then we plan to go to FC in July. So how about uh, the back pay for civil servants? Will that be back pay? Well, back pay will be dating back to the 1st of April, but then when can that be implemented uh, if it's passed uh, by the 11th of July? My, understand, my understanding is um, in August, so it will be dated back to Ju uh, April, right? Yes. All right, next item. Yes, Mr. Tang. Well, if we are going to have a meeting on the 23rd of June, so we'll be deciding on the figure. So you will then go to the FC before the 11th of July. So it's the outcome of a consultation with all the stakeholders, and it's also an established uh, process. But then uh, last year, we had an unhappy experience, and some of the important stakeholders uh, were not involved in the process. So is it necessary for us to invite the deputations to come before the 23rd of June with regard to the adjustment rate and also the uh, mechanism for adjustment? I think we do have the duty to invite civil service uh, groups are uh, to come and tell us, or else uh, on the 23rd of June, we'll already be deciding on the rate of adjustment, right? 
bureau director. In fact, uh, after next week, we'll be meeting with different civil service uh, councils to discuss with them their aspirations, and then uh, together with their request, we'll be submitting a report uh, to the administration. I think the civil service unions have been here before, last year, last year, because uh, um, uh, the schedule is pretty tight. So I'll leave it uh, to the bureau director, who will then take it up with the civil service unions. All right. Next. Uh, Consultation on extension of the service of civil servants. Last time you uh, briefed us um, on the consultation, and uh, that will uh, last for four months until the 2nd of August 2014. And at the last meeting, I suggested that uh, we should invite the relevant civil service associations or unions on the consultation in July uh, 2014. So the last meeting will be held on the 21st of July at 10.45, it's a Monday. So I'd like to consult members to see if you agree that we should also hold this public hearing on the same morning. So at our regular meeting held on the 21st of July, we may have to advance it uh, to a bit earlier, say 9.30, would that be okay? It's not really too early, it's already a very civilized um, hour. 9.30 because uh, we often have uh, meetings at 8.30. So 9.30 is already a very civilized hour. So July the 21st at 9.30, and we'll invite the civil service unions to come and talk to us about uh, their views on the extension of the service of civil servants. Next, uh, use of agency workers, Mr. Lee Chet Yen. has looked at uh, the issue about the use of agency workers in relation to a court case, and uh, he'd like the administration to provide us with some information before the meeting. And according to Mr. Lee's request, uh, we have already written to the administration asking for a response. I think the administration has given its reply this morning. I have received it this morning, but I, I haven't got time to go through that. So um, can Mr. Tang, the bureau director, walk us through that? Yes, um, there are just two points that I'd like to make with regard to the use of agency workers. Well, if you look at our guidelines back in 2010, we already introduced this guideline for bureaus and departments on the use of agency workers. And then after that, uh, in 2011, we issued a supplementary guideline. And of course, uh, in 2011, we introduced the minim statutory minimum wage. We updated that accordingly. In simple terms, with regard to the use of agency workers, the scope should be confined to one of the followings. One, to meet um, emergency need, which has been unforeseen. And second, to uh, fill some short-term vacancies. And number three, in hiring short-term staff to provide a service, well, uh, the mode of service will be changing very shortly and falsely because of the mode uh, that has not been fixed. And also, we also have to um, uh, uh, recruit uh, people to fill such uh, vacancies, which are short-term. And uh, normally, that should not last for more than nine months. And the latest position is well, on the 30th of September last year, different bureaus and departments, well, there are a total of uh, 972 members uh, working on that basis, and that represented the reduction by 17% because back then we used to have 1,173 such workers. As regards uh, the agency workers, well, usually they would just uh, be providing um, some uh, office uh, support and other and also uh, project coordination work and some 49 percent uh, were sourced to meet urgent or unforeseen service needs and 18 percent were deployed to fill short-term manpower gap mainly arising from the time required to recruit civil servants and or non-civil service contract staff so uh, the time that has taken 
was a bit longer than expected. Another 15 percent were procured to deliver services, the mode of which would likely to be changed shortly, and for the remaining 18 percent, they were deployed to meet service needs that entail an irregular work pattern or where the nature of work involved render it difficult to recruit and retain staff. As regards the case referred to by Mr. Lee, we have also uh, contacted uh, the Education Bureau to find out more about that. And basically, there are two points that I'd like to share with members. Well, as far as the workers who are concerned, of course, they are agency workers. That's why in terms of the employment relationship, well, that's between the agency and the workers, and the Education Bureau was not involved. And of course, if there are agencies who have violated uh, uh, the law or whatever, then uh, whether it's the Education Bureau or other bureau or departments, uh, they would also consider whether or not the agency should be taken out of the list. So for agencies that have violated the law or broken any rules, uh, we do have a way to um, follow up. So that's my brief reply uh, to the questions that have been asked. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Tang, Mr. Kwok, and Deputy Chairman, so each will be given five minutes for all together. Mr. Chair first, Tony Chair, who, uh, who first, uh, sorry, Mr. Kwok. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of uh, points. Well, for some departments or bureaus, you talk about the four criteria, urgent or unforeseen service needs, short-term manpower gap, and also uh, the service mode will be changing, and also because of irregular work pattern and so on. That's why you have such contracts, and we're talking about some 900 plus agency workers, and the number has already come down when compared to a few years back, so it represents an improvement. But I still have a number of questions. Number one, in paragraph seven of the paper, it says that uh, for the for the uh, tenderers, they will have to meet one of the uh, they will have to meet the following two benchmarks, and if they are not able to meet um, either one of them, then uh, their bids will not be accepted. One is uh, statutory minimum wage; that's a statutory requirement, and also the CNS department in 2010 December, uh, the CNS department published the quarterly report of wage and payroll statistics and. Uh, there is um, an average monthly wage. So my question is, today is already 2014, and we find it strange. How come the line is drawn so low? So we're talking about four years ago. So you're talking about December 2010, and it's still drawn at the average monthly wages for December 2010, because the CNS department has been compiling statistics on a monthly basis. So even if you, well, because we're talking about a nine-month contract. So theoretically, at least uh, you should have been able to catch it up um, or catch up until 2012 or 13. So how come it has to be dated back to 2010, such a long time ago? So why have you adhered to the figure which is dated back such a long time ago? Because, um, well, uh, on, in recent years, we're talking about an average annual inflation rate of about 4 to 5 percent. So is it that uh, these agencies are still paying their staff at uh, the rate uh, uh, four years ago? And the second point that I'd like to know is, well, according to the Bureau Director, most of the contracts last for nine months, and when necessary, that can be extended for uh, six months or longer, and they, they will have to seek approval from the CSB. So for these nine-month contracts, uh, have they bypassed the six-month uh, mechanism? So instead of uh, renewing it uh, on a regular basis, uh, have they been renewing on a six-monthly uh, or nine-monthly basis? Thank you, Mr. Kwok, for your questions. Now, first of all, as I mentioned just now, starting from 2020, we issued a set of guidelines. And at that time, um, there was no statutory minimum wage. And that is why we adopted the benchmark as uh, set in para 7.2. That is the relevant average monthly wages um, as in the CNSD report. But basically, after the implementation of SF SMW, we adopt the uh, benchmark uh, of SMW. 
Now, um, maybe the average monthly wages uh, may still be higher than the SMW, uh, but perhaps uh, the uh, for these um, workers, their wages may be higher than uh, the level of SMW in 2010. Uh, for example, the average monthly wages of a particular worker may be lower than the SMW uh, prevailing, and then the worker should receive the SMW wages to meet the uh, legal requirement. Uh, perhaps uh, let me uh, pardon me for interjecting. That means uh, there are two benchmarks, and uh, the higher benchmark should prevail. That is, if um, a worker is paid uh, a monthly average uh, wages which uh, are lower than the SMW, uh, say um, uh, 12,000 or so, that uh, it will be paid at that high benchmark. As for the other part of the question, I'll defer to my colleague about the period of the contract. We have set up very clearly in a set of guidelines that we would look at the uh, whole time frame. For example, for a nine-month contract, if a bureau or a department would like to renew the contract for six months or above, then according to our supplementary guidelines, they are required to apply to the CSB for approval. And then we will scrutinize their application um, stringently. And the bureaus and departments have been very uh, careful in this regard. and. Uh, over the past six months, we have not received any application seeking approval from CSB for extension of the contract uh, for more than 15 months. Next, Mr. Tang Kapiu. Thank you. I think these polls, uh, most of them, uh, would require um, at least tertiary education for the um, low skilled uh, jobs, they're mostly outsourced. Well, Mr. Lee, in his uh, letter, talked about a case, and although your response is that although the uh, lady uh, who was subject to exploitation and abuse uh, took up another post in the Education Bureau, so the situation was different from uh, working under an agency. In fact, you're just uh, finding an exit. That is, she was unable to work uh, in the uh, as a as a um, government employee as uh, or NCSC, and only when um, there was a lawsuit involving um, discrimination against her pregnancy, she was ultimately hired as an agency um, employee, so or contract employee. So the uh, cruel reality is that um, contract staff work for a long time and still they cannot join the civil service. Now, in terms of the overall figure, uh, the number of agency workers have dropped uh, undeniably because of pressure from labor unions. However, for some departments, like the um, Depart Department of Health, uh, they have 288 uh, wor agency workers. Although um, this figure has dropped uh, from previous years, still the level um, uh, of um, decrease is still far from um, that uh, for AFCD or LCSD. So what are these agency workers responsible for? Is it that uh, some posts are already converted to NCSC or uh, civil service posts, and you're just trying to compare uh, the efficiency? Also, would you extend the practice of offering paid rest days to agency workers. Well, perhaps I will first take the questions and then I'll ask my colleagues to supplement about Education Bureau's case. In that case, first of all, that employee was an employee um, with an employment agency. and. She did not just, perhaps, did not just serve the government, but rather other bodies. So it's it was difficult to 
compare uh, her polls with other civil service polls. And I understand her um, for her new polls, uh, she has undergone um, open recruitment, which is different from um, the uh, agency contract. And uh, for that department, there are 168 agency workers at the moment. These workers are of a supplementary nature because the service units have rolled out some short term services. So perhaps my colleague can say more on uh, the work of agency workers of a Department of Health. As for the 168 work agency workers in DOH, 120 of them are workmen too in various uh, DOH clinics. And at that time, the Department of Health was reviewing non core tasks and assessing whether these can be outsourced. So in the beginning of this year, these 120 agency workers were no longer under um, the DOH uh, uh, working as workman too, as the um, work had been outsourced. So that's really a tragedy from um, NCSC to agency workers to finally the uh, jobs being outsourced. Now, still, there are 100 and, um, well, the figures as uh, of uh, September 2012 uh, was so-and-so, um, and, -so, and uh, what about the latest figures? Now, remember, would the member please refer to the annex for the updated data? This is the position as at the 30th of September 2013. For the Department of Health, there were 168 agency workers. And as I said just now, 120 of them uh, were not working as agency workers. So you can minus that figure. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I really don't have the figure. I just have this table. That is the latest position as at the 30th of September 2013. Perhaps the Bureau can explain in greater detail which paper. This is uh, in the discussion paper. Oh, I'm sorry. I see that now. Any other questions? Mr. Tang, your time is up. Next, Mr. Tony Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, um, there are objective reasons for using agency workers. I see that the figures have continued to decline in recent years. What is the reason of this the, uh, this continuous decline? Is it because there is no longer such need, or is the mode uh, has the mode changed? For example, has it changed to um, contract or NCSC, uh, non civil servants contract, so and so forth, and also. I see from the figures, it seems uh, the housing department is not included here. As I understand, Madam Chair, the housing department used 900 agency workers. Uh, I mean, there are 900 uh, or so work agency workers in this table, but for housing department alone, they employ uh, over 1,100 uh, agency workers. Some are technical staff, such as engineers or architects. Some have worked for more than six years. I mean, many uh, have worked for more than six years as agency employees. So my first question is, is the housing department excluded from this table? If so, how can the um, Bureau ensure that the Housing Department would follow the set of guidelines issued by the CSB say, uh, in terms of, say, for example, the um, uh, limit on the uh, period of contract and the conditions for using agency workers and whether they're following the guidelines? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your question. First, on the figures, I think there are several reasons. 
As mentioned just now, uh, some believe that the service can be provided by outsourcing um, the contract and on completion of certain uh, service contract, some departments may um, have um, confirmed the service needs and therefore create civil service polls as well as um, non-civil service polls. So there are a number of reasons to explain why um, there are fewer agency workers now. As for the housing department, the housing authority is financially independent. They have their own set of guidelines to regulate um, the units on the use of agency workers. As I understand, there are about 800 employees. And this has to do with the need to increase public housing supply. And uh, within a short period of time, they need more manpower to do the work. Anything to supplement, Mr. Chen? Nothing. Well, Madam Chair, as you heard, one department uh, uses um, agency employees, uh, and the number is equal to all these departments. Uh, the sum of all these departments. So even though HAC is financially independent, I think, um, well, as uh, said by many uh, labor unions, say maintenance and repair surveyors, uh, over 25 percent of them are under agency contracts, and most of them are professionals, and they have um, been um, in such an employment relationship for a long time. So, uh, as Secretary just said, uh, there are over 800 of them. I think that, after all, this is public money. The guidelines or the procedures should be the same. Although they, they may be financially independent, it doesn't mean they can uh, have all the say. So, I don't know. How monitoring uh, can be achieved? Is it under uh, this secretary's purview or other secretaries? Now, is it because HA is independent that uh, the figure of housing department is not included here, secretary? As we understand, these agency contracts are signed by the housing authority, not the housing department. Of course, the housing department is uh, uh, operated by civil servants. As for the use of agency employees, the a the housing authority um, is in a position to make its own decisions. Um, I will uh, reflect members' concerns to the HA. I think HA is a responsible body. If there is no such service need, I don't think they would casually use agency employees. Of course, they are aware of our set of guidelines, and uh, I think their guidelines have taken into account the uh, characteristics of um, and circumstances of HA. Uh, they are financially independent, but of course, we can reflect members' concerns to them. Next, Mr. Pun Xiuping, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. My question is similar to Mr. Chair's, and Secretary has just answered him. So I have another question. For um, agency workers, it's uh, nine months followed by 15 months if it's renewed further. In fact, 9% of the contracts in 2012 were over 15 months. Now it's gone. Is it because uh, the contracts only lasted for nine months and no extension of contract was given or was there no longer such service needs. Now, this set of guidelines do not cover, uh, does not cover T contracts or LCSD uh, li um, library staff. The wage level is, uh, especially for LCSD library staff, is close to $30, the SMW uh, rate prevailing. So it's on the low side, 
um, and we are a service provider. We do not want the agencies to exploit their staff. So on reviewing the arrangement of employment agencies, uh, how is it done by the government? And uh, there are 972 agency workers. Uh, that's the latest figure. Last time, it was 1,172. So for these staff, they are no longer hired by agencies. So have they now been hired uh, through other forms or means? Well, I answer part of the question, and then for the rest, I'll defer to my colleague. Well, f well, the figure has come down. Well, there has been a reduction by several hundred, and uh, they used to be agency workers because they were hired by the agencies, and uh, they might have been deployed uh, by their agencies to other uh, positions. Because after all, they are not government employees. As regards why the uh, number of agency workers uh, has come down, well, as I've already explained, well, in some cases we have outsourced the work, and one of the reasons is we do have some short-term needs, and uh, after uh, that has uh, lapsed, in some cases we have also um, taken a bit longer to recruit regular staff. That's why uh, in the interim we have to use the agency workers, but then uh, in terms of um, our planning for recruitment by individual bureaus and departments, um, that has improved. That's why, in terms of the interim needs, that has greatly reduced. That's why we are using fewer agency workers. Now, I'll defer to my colleague, uh, Mr. Chen, um, who will explain to you the further details. Yes, um, Deputy Chairman, you mentioned the figures. Well, as I just reported to members, that during the past year or so, we have not received any application from bureaus or departments for extension of the contract to more than 15 months. In other words, bureaus and departments have been very careful in reviewing their staffing situation. As regards the existing 972 agency workers, if they've been working for more than 15 months on contract, then, well, there are 130 that have been on contract for more than 15 months. Most of them are regular contracts. In other words, they do not have to uh, report for duty every day and only where they are needed. Then the department or bureaus, when they need extra staff, they'll ask these agency workers to come and report for duty. So that's the existing figure. Thank you. Next, uh, second round, Kwok uh, Waikang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, since the implementation of SMW, we have been arguing whether or not a paid, uh, rest day should be paid. And I'm relieved to see that, uh, well, for the rest day for every period of seven days uh, is paid. But then, what I'd like to know is, for these um, contract agency workers, would they be entitled to civil service um, benefits? And uh, to put it more directly, what kind of benefits are they entitled to? Because whether they are agency workers or the so-called NCSC staff, They are actually serving the community, and they are also assisting departments uh, in discharging their public duties. So even if their employment period is short, I think they should be entitled to some basic civil service benefits. So what is the view of the Bureau, and will you consider offering this to them? The most simple form would be an outpatient clinic uh, quota or other benefits uh, that an ordinary civil servant is entitled to. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kwok, for your question. We also have to clarify the situation that is uh, for agency workers. Basically, they are not government employees, so whether or not 
they are entitled to health care benefits and so on. That's the um, duty of the agency, not the government. So we are just procuring the service of the agency, and then the agency will be deploying its staff to work for government departments and bureaus. So, so we have to clarify the employment relationship. Madam Chair, I'd like to know a bit more about this. All right, uh, the bureau director was uh, very specific. So it's uh, for the agency to provide such benefits to them. But then they have uh, put in their bids, and of course the lowest bids uh, will win. Unless you say that uh, in considering their bids, you would also consider whether or not such agencies would be offering um, employee benefits uh, to them, and that would also be taken into account. If that is the case, then of course it's the duty of the agency. If not, then the administration cannot shirk its responsibility. It cannot say that, uh, well, if they are not offering such uh, to their employees, it's none of my business. Well, Mr. Kwok, in scrutinizing their bids, uh, we do have the minimum requirements, for example, statutory minimum wage and also uh, one paid rest day for every seven days. We believe that uh, that that is a very specific requirement because for individual agencies, uh, their benefits would vary. And uh, we do not rule the possibility that some agency workers, well, as Mr. Chen just said, in some cases, some departments would only be hiring those people on a need basis. So they would only be called back for work when there is a need. For At other times, they might be engaging in other work, and in some agencies, uh, they might actually be providing other services, and therefore it's difficult to align their benefits to those of civil servants. The most important thing is they will have to be paid uh, SMW, and they will also have to have um, a paid rest day. For the other benefits, it's very difficult to take that into account. Well, Madam Chair, well, the Bureau Director cited a very special example. For example, some workers might only be required today, and then uh, tomorrow they might be working elsewhere. So it's not a continuous contract. But then if you look at the paper, there are many who might have uh, worked for you continuously for nine months. So can that be considered? So instead of just uh, telling us that uh, there are a handful of cases uh, who might not be required to work on consecutive days, and therefore what I request should be turned down. So do you agree, number one, that they are also serving government departments, and number two, they are actually helping the government in providing public services? So do you agree with those statements? Well, the example that I cited was of course a more classic example. But then basically even if you work for nine months, it's not a very uh, lengthy contract at all. So we have to clarify the employment relationship because that should be the um, uh, the basis for any uh, employee benefit. And of course uh, you also said that uh, they would they were providing uh, community services, for example, even for the outsourced uh, agencies, they are also providing direct or indirect services, and even for the subsidized uh, or subvented bodies, they are also providing public services. So even for subvented bodies, their staffs uh, benefits uh, basically would also have to be determined by these agencies themselves. Madam Chair, I don't think I need to put it further to the bureau director because. Uh, Earlier on, we talk about uh, people or NCSC staff uh, who have uh, worked for 10 years. They are also not entitled to any benefit. And now for these agency workers, they are also not entitled to any benefits at all. So if they are not recruited as civil servants uh, in the first place, then they are not given any employee benefits. So they are faced with a situation whereby they are not given or offered any uh, employee benefits. So does any other member wish to ask questions. We have already discussed that for some time. We still have one more item to discuss. The implementation of paternity leave in the government and government-funded public bodies. All right, if there are no further questions, then we'll move on to item five, because I have to attend the railway subcommittee meeting. So I'll ask the deputy chairman to chair the next item on my behalf. All right, uh, um, Bureau Director, please walk us through the paper. Yes, there are a couple of points about the implementation of paternity leave in the government and government-funded public bodies. Since the 1st of April 2012, we've been providing five working days of paternity leave with full pay to eligible government employees, and we have already reported uh, to you in February 2013 on the latest position. And the latest situation is that during the past two years, we have already um, offered uh, some 5,524 workers uh, with such uh, paid uh, 
a paternity leave and including 5,281 civil servants and 243 non-civil servants. And after implementing that for two years or so, we can see that uh, the situation with bureaus and departments has been smooth and the views on the paternity leave arrangements are positive. And uh, we are now considering extending that to all um, workers in Hong Kong by legislation. And upon the end of the consultation, we will decide whether or not our plan would have to be further improved. With regard to the progress of the implementation of paternity leave in the government, that's uh, as I just reported. I'll defer to my colleagues who will tell you more about um, the situation with regard to uh, public bodies and also government subsidized or subvented bodies. Yes, thank you. I'll briefly go over this in response to the panel's request. We have approached uh, some public bodies uh, funded by the administration, asking them about uh, the situation with regard to the provision of paternity leave to their employees. We have issued questionnaire to 58 bodies, and according to the reply, only 33, which are statutory um, public bodies. For the others, um, either they have not uh, received any public funding, or they are all contract staff and uh, they have not hired any uh, male staff at all. That's why they are not affected. So out of the 33 uh, that are subject to our survey, some 20 provided full paid paternity leave, 13 did not do so. And then for the 20 providing full paid paternity leave, 85% offered five days of paid leave, 15, three days. And then for the 20, that offered full pay paternity leave. Half of them do not restrict their employees uh, on whether or not uh, they are married. So there is no requirement on their uh, marital status. And uh, for the rest, uh, yes, uh, those uh, employees will have to indicate that they are married, but then they would also be prepared to consider their individual circumstances. And out of the 20 uh, organizations, some 19 overwhelmingly large majority would require them to have to meet certain service period requirement and most uh, would require them to have served uh, for at least uh, 40 weeks. And then for the 20 organizations, some 18 would allow their employees' uh, children to be born um, elsewhere. And they would also accept uh, documentation or certification issued overseas. And uh, most of them would require uh, birth certificate, uh, marriage certificate, or the uh, pregnancy certificate of the mother. Other than that, uh, they also do not have any particular restrictions on the taking of paternity leave. So that's all I'd like to report. Thank you. All right, the floor is now open. Five minutes each. First, um, Long Chi Cheng. Thank you, Chairman. Well, the DAB welcomes the administrations taking the lead to offer paid paternity leave to male workers. In particular, male workers will have to assist their wives in um, giving birth. And during this period, uh, they will have to take better care of their families. But then uh, if it's just uh, confined to the government, Yes, later on, you will be introducing legislation, but then you're giving people the impression that, all right, you're taking the lead. But how about other public bodies? You said that you conducted uh, a survey, and some have been doing it, others not. So as the administration, um, other than taking the lead, you will also have to step up your efforts with the larger uh, enterprises and corporations uh, by encouraging them to offer paid paternity leave to their employees. As we said, um, it's a philosophy, it's a service, so that uh, there can be more harmony in our society. So have you considered stepping up publicity? No. Secretary. Oh, I'm so Thank you, Chair. The Labor Department has all along been promoting and publicizing to various organizations and bodies family-friendly um, work um, employment policies, in particular paternity leave. And in the year the civil service started to have paternity leave, we prepared leaflets 
and then for the 400 uh, government funded or subsidized public bodies we issued letters to them and c encouraged them to adopt um, and provide paternity leave and in march this year we introduced the employment uh, amendment bill which if passed All private and public organizations would need to meet the statutory requirement and provide employees with paternity leave for the male staff. Next, Mr. Kwok Wai Kong, followed by Mr. Tam Yo Chung. Thank you, Chair. Now, for government employees, I mean, we looked at the figures last year. We discussed them. So I won't pursue the question. Uh, on the contrary, I'd like to ask uh, about the 20 uh, government-funded public bodies offering full paid um, paternity leave out of the 33 government-funded public bodies. Now, two questions. In Annex A and B, I see two different systems. Annex A applies to government employees. For babies born out of wedlock, the Secretary for the Civil Service has discretion to grant paternity leave. However, Annex B, uh, in paraformal status, among the 20 organizations, 10 did not impose any restrictions on the employee's marital status, while the other 10 indicated that they provide maternity leave only to married employees. And uh, my question is whether the government would coordinate and ask all the government body, uh, all, uh, all these public bodies, to follow the government's practice in allowing paternity leave to eligible employees, whether or not the babies are born out of wedlock or not. The other question is about uh, another issue. Did the government departments or public bodies, have you calculated the extra costs or extra um, spending for paternity leave? We'd like to know the cost for pro offering paternity leave in government departments. Also, there are organizations um, giving, say, just three days of paternity leave, etc. I mean, the, the picture varies. My question is whether extra resources are needed for implementing paternity leave in the future. Perhaps I'll take the question first, and then I will defer to my colleague to supplement. Now, for babies born out of wedlock, um, it depends on uh, the examination of the bill. Of course, government uh, believes that uh, paternity, paternity leave should also be given to babies born out of wedlock, but um, the view may not be the same for other um, bodies. As for costs, we do not have information at this regard, but from the Bureau's response, they have not expressed any difficulty in terms of resources. So it's been implemented for just a year or two, and so far, we have not seen any significant financial implication on the part of the government. And we have not uh, formally assessed uh, financially the impact. But from the feedback from government departments, um, we don't see a big problem in terms of um, the department's operations or um, financial implications. So. Now, if the Employment Amendment Bill is passed, all employers in the private sector as well as public bodies will be required to provide paternity leave to employees regardless of the marital status. So if the bill is passed, these public bodies and private organizations would have to provide paternity leave to all eligible employees regardless regardless of the marital status financial commitment for employers if they're required to provide three day paternity leave to employees then um, the uh, the commitment would be 140 million dollars accounting for 0.02 percent of the total wages next mr Tam Yu chong 
A question for the Labour Department. For government-funded public bodies, you've conducted the survey. Have you conducted the survey on private enterprises and organizations? I think uh, that um, the, the some of them are quite generous. They uh, offer voluntarily paternity leave up to five days. We have eight. Uh, we have the 18 Human Resources Manager Club, and covering 1,580 organizations. We conducted the survey in 2012, and 576 and 30 responded. 38.7 percent of the respondent offered paternity leave uh, of an average of three days. And uh, that's uh, three days uh, at most. Uh, over 40 percent offered three days, and 81 uh, percent offered one to three days paternity leave. For these organizations, they might be larger uh, enterprises with human resources managers, etc. But Hong Kong um, ha has uh, more SMEs, so will the picture be different? Oh, Chair, the picture, uh, the situation is different. According to the survey, the larger the enterprise, um, the more likely um, the enterprise will offer paternity leave. And the situation is different for SMEs, for example. For an organization with over 1,000 employees, 52.8% um, offered paternity leave. As for organizations with 20 or less uh, staff members, only 20% offered paternity leave. So basically, the larger the enterprise or organization, the more likely um, it is going to provide paternity leave. No follow-up. Next, Mr. Tenkapio. The Civil Service Bureau has accumulated over 5,000 cases. And at the same time, the Legislative Council is scrutinizing the um, uh, paternity leave uh, bill, uh, requiring all to follow in the future. So will there be any analysis showing us the implementation of paternity leave and the cost um, added to employers? According to the Labor Welfare Bureau, uh, if I remember correctly, their, um, their estimate is that uh, there will be an extra 0.1% or so. So will you draw a line and set out in detail the um, spending for employers so that we can be clear? For three days paternity leave at four fifths um, average daily wage, what will be the costs uh, entailed? Secondly, if um, well, you should publicize the good deeds. Now, uh, for the 33 organizations, now uh, putting that aside, what about the 20 uh, organizations providing fully paid paternity leave? Any. Um, Restriction on publicizing the names of these 20 good employers. Let me take Mr. Tang's question. Uh, on the first point, as I answered Mr. Kwok's question, and as explained by Mr. Ho about the cost, I think um, the LAB uh, and also the LegCo is discussing um, a figure. And I think that this may not apply to government. Um, to the government. Um, we're talking about smaller companies, um, and the cost implications are very different from the government spendings. So I think um, the figure well, won't serve any reference value. On the contrary, I think we should disseminate this message that two years after implementing paternity leave within the government, um, we see no operational problems. We won't give extra resources to government departments and bureaus. And they will have to absorb the um, additional uh, burden. But on the one hand, uh, the number of days 
uh, limited and operationally, the departments could cope with uh, its implementation. So one thing is that the government is different from private enterprises. For the government, of course, it has better means to offer fully paid paternity leave than private companies. Next, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hoy, perhaps Mr. Hoy can supplement. The Labor Department survey is similar to other surveys. When we issued the questionnaire, we uh, tell the respondents that their identities will not be disclosed, and this is important because we need their cooperation in the survey. And if they are not cooperative, we are going to get a very low uh, response rate, or the information may not be accurate. So our survey, um, we for the survey, we tell them in advance that the data received will not be disclosed, and their names will not be disclosed. And on this reason, we don't agree to make available the list of names because. Paternity leave is just one of the employment benefits, and we cannot single out uh, organizations and say that by providing paternity leave or not, they are good employers or otherwise. So will you be conducting more surveys, say, for public bodies? Do they have, um, do they have other related family-friendly um, employment policies? Since they are very committed, for example, during school holidays, employees may uh, be able to have day offs. Now, the problem with the labor sector is uh, that even when the children are on school holidays, um, their parents cannot take uh, day offs to stay with them. So, will you consider um, and do more in this regard? On family-friendly employment practices, we conduct surveys, but we do not just focus on public bodies. But as I said just now, in 2012, because the law didn't just apply to um, public bodies, and the survey wanted to um, and seek to, to find out the difference between private and public bodies, um, as said just now. For the 1,580 uh, organizations uh, under the survey, we also collect um, statistics uh, in this regard. I also have a question. The government has implemented paternity leave for two years, and some 5,500 civil servants have taken paternity leave. Now, the paper says that the government will um, uh, review the situation regularly, and the CE um, just vi uh, had duty visits in Sweden. Uh, they have 10 days paternity leave in UK. They're 14. So, will the government consider increasing the number of days per uh, for paternity leave? Now, the second question is for uh, a couple, uh, both of whom are government employees. Um, even for the male employee, uh, he's only eligible for five days paternity leave. Uh, will you consider allowing them to combine the uh, leave days and for the couple to decide by themselves how to um, divide divide uh, the leave days? Uh, first of all, although implement implementation is smooth, we still need to look at the pr um, the progress of the bill. And so far, we have not set down a date for reviewing the legislation. And we have not heard uh, any strong response from employees uh, on uh, five days being insufficient. And it hasn't been implemented for a long time. So we don't think it is appropriate at this juncture to consider increasing the number of days for paternity leave. Uh, each society is different, and it's difficult to uh, just copy another play, um, another country's model. Uh, as for the second question, I think you are talking about two civil servants uh, as a married couple, and for the female employee, she's eligible for the maternity leave. For the male employee, he's eligible for paternity leave.
the um, maternity leave is packed to the 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 delivery date, and the basically the male employee should um, take paternity leave on days after the the the, the baby is born. Now, for maternity leave is ten weeks. Paternity leave, uh, ten uh, five days altogether. They have seventy five days of leave. For the husband, he can only take five days off. Perhaps if their leave can be combined, then they may be. Um, they may they may say that the husband can take ten days uh, off uh, to take care of the baby, and uh, this arrangement will be more flexible. Thank you. This is a very um, innovative idea. But then the, the difficulty is, as far as the government is concerned, for every individual, even if they are couples, well, the um, entitlements or benefits would be for the individuals, and therefore for the maternity leave of um, uh, uh, four weeks um, antenatal and uh, six weeks uh, postnatal, we cannot cut the leave entitlement of the wife um, as far as maternity leave uh, is concerned. Next, uh, Mr. Kwok. All right, uh, the paternity leave arrangement has been in place for two years, and I think this is a good um, arrangement and uh, is supported by all civil service Unions. We also have to look at the cost and how public money is used. And therefore, according to the Bureau Director, he said that with regard to government employees' uh, paternity leave, uh, whether or not it has incurred uh, extra uh, spending, well, if you don't have the figures, uh, it's unjustifiable. Because let's say next year, if we were to uh, grant extra funding for that purpose, then how much of that has to do with paternity leave? I think it's better if we can have a better idea because uh, in the private market, a survey has been done. So we'd like to know uh, how do the two compare in terms of cost uh, between the public and private markets. So I hope that the Bureau Director will make an attempt to do it. With regard to the 33 public bodies, I think it's also um, worth doing it so that we'll be able to find out the cost implications. So will the Bureau Director consider that? The next question is, in the paper, you talk about uh, 5,524 eligible employees. So I'd like to know, throughout the process, are there any who were not eligible, and in the end, uh, are there any who are eligible but have not taken paternity leave? So, are there special cases, or there might not have been any at all? Bureau Director, if I understand it correctly, uh, none of the applications uh, has been rejected. And uh, for the figures, my personal view is well, Mr. Kwok, yes, I understand that uh, you'd like to extend it, but then in terms of the cost borne by the administration, it might not uh, be comparable to the private sector. Uh, and therefore, the figures uh, quoted just now would be of a higher reference value. And basically, it's difficult to single this out uh, from the overall spending for civil servants. Well. Chairman, I understand that there might be some difficulties, but then the reason why I'm asking for this, other than the fact that I'd like to know the figure, I'd also like the private sector employers uh, would understand this, because uh, they are actually finding it hard to swallow, saying that even for three days of paternity leave, uh, it would eat into the uh, very cost of them. But then uh, if the administration is taking up this share, then uh, the cost is not that far away from that in the private sector. It's not just about the use of public money or that uh, they are paid uh, full pay. So I hope that uh, the employers in the private sector would understand it uh, a bit more. So it's not that uh, I'd just like to get hold of the figures. I'd like the private employers to have a better understanding. The reason why we are saying that uh, for paternity leave, well, for those families with newborn babies, uh, is very important. And the way it is implemented uh, is that everybody will share out the cost. Well, Permanent Secretary, yes, I'd like to supplement. Other than the practical difficulties, indeed, uh, that might not be very helpful to Mr. 
because uh, as far as the private sector is concerned, I think the current discussion is, well, the SMEs, uh, will they be able to afford it? Well, for the SMEs, they would not think that, uh, given the fact that uh, the administration has a huge reserve with 160,000 civil servants, and therefore whatever is affordable to the administration may not um, be affordable to them. All right. Are there any further questions? If not, then we'll wrap up our discussion on this item. And next, uh, AOB. Any AOB? If not, then we'll wrap up our discussion here. So meeting is now adjourned.